Paranos Honora O'Neill, I wish to congratulate you with the Holberg Prize. Uh, the Holberg Committee writes, Honora O'Neill is one of the most distinguished and influential philosophers of her generation. Her bold, scholarly and deeply humane work has shed light on some of the most pressing intellectual and practical challenges of our time. The committee emphasizes both that you have made significant contributions to a wide range of topics and that you have had great impact in the public sphere. I thought that we could attempt to cover quite a few of the topics that you've worked on over, over five decades. But perhaps we should, we should start on a more biographical note, a little bit about your background and uh, why on earth you started studying philosophy in the first place. Well, I'm quite surprised that I did. Um, <laughs> I come from Northern Ireland. I spent my childhood, I was a war baby, so we moved around. I spent uh, my childhood largely in uh, London and uh, Germany with some, uh, all the holidays in Northern Ireland. And uh, I thought history would be my passion. And I went to Oxford when I was 18 to study history. And six months later, I found myself trying to persuade my tutors that actually I wanted to do philosophy with psychology and they permitted me to do it. And I would still not have thought that I would work on Immanuel Kant. That did not seem to me at all a plausible thing, particularly because both my tutors were extremely hostile to Kant. And also, when I, uh, they, I was conscientiously required to read Kant's groundwork, and I did, and I read it carefully, and I thought, well, done there, been there, been there done that, that, that's it. <laughs> so uh, it was partly the lucky coincidence that when I reached Harvard as a graduate student, there were some excellent people working on Kant there. There was, of course, um, uh, Charles Parsons, who gave the course on uh, the critique of pure reason and whose passion was Kant's philosophy of mathematics, which I still think is rather wonderful. And uh, then there was Jack Rawls, uh, who didn't seem to be particularly interested in Kant at the time, but actually was. And there was also Stanley Cavell, and I was his teaching assistant. And to my horror, I had to teach religion within the limits of reason alone to Harvard freshmen. Mm -hmm. That was a discipline. <laughs> I think that's quite a common experience for um, many people who have worked extensively on Kant is exactly that, that it's not exactly love at first sight. Absolutely not. And uh, to me, it was v very reluctantly back to Kant, to use a famous 19th century phrase. I did go back to Kant, but only after thinking, well, I really am interested in what is practical reason? What is reasoning about action? So I thought, well, very obviously, it lies in models of rational choice. And I took a seminar with Robert Nozick, who uh, uh, later became a famous libertarian, but he was then a utilitarian. And we read Luce and Rafer's Games and Decisions. So I was working on game theory and decision theory. And I wrote a little paper and he said, that's very nice, you should publish it. And I had that moment of inner revulsion. Yeah. I thought, that cannot be what reason is. And then I started reading more broadly, more formalistic accounts of reason. Some of those 20th century uh, philosophers whom we don't read so much now, like Marcus Singer or Kurt Beyer. And as you can see, rather slowly back to Kant, and initially just can I make sense of the categorical imperative? But even more narrowly than that, can it guide action? So that's how I came back to Kant, as you can see, not galloping enthusiasm at all. <laughs> One of the central terms that you've taken from Kant is that of public reason. Mm. Could you exp please expand on why that is such an important concept to you? It became important, I, I suppose, to many people in the late 20th century, including uh, John Rawls and, uh, of course, Jürgen Habermas, former winner of the Holberg Prize. Uh, and I think that both of them politicised the phrase to some extent. That's to say they identified it with public discourse, actual public discourse, public discourse where all may participate. In Rawls' case, the discourse among uh, uh, fellow citizens in a bounded liberal democratic society. So those are conceptions of public reason, but they're quite politicised conceptions. 
Kant has a more, again, a more economical, more parsimonious conception. For him, public reason is reasons that can be given, a phrase that he uses in, here and there, to the world at large. Yeah. Uh, so you might say that's closer to the direction that Amartya Sen has recently taken the concept of public reason. But I think it is uh, interesting if your thought is to be plausible, I mustn't make extravagant assumptions. And so that's why I found Kant's distinction between public reason and what he calls, in a sense we don't use now, private reason, increasingly interesting. Now, this connects to the next question I'd like to ask you, um, because a technical term that has been quite central to your philosophy is constructivism. Yeah. And when people hear the term constructivism today, they tend to naturally think of social constructivism, exactly. which is, of course, not what you are uh, referring to. Um, could you please uh, tell us what you mean by constructivism and why you have chosen such an approach to human rights, global justice, and so on? I suppose that constructivism, again, uh, is this question of economy or parsimony in your starting points. How much can you build with how little? Mm. And uh, there's a wonderful passage at the beginning of the doctrine of method in Kant's Critique of Pure Reason, where he says of uh, human reasoning, uh, what we'd love to have done is to build a tower that would reach the heavens, like the Tower of Babel, but unfortunately it falls down, and that we can't do. So we have to work with the materials that are available to us, uh, and with that we may be able to build, construct, a modest house on the plane of experience. So that is, to me, the passage out of which the appropriateness of the metaphor of building or construction comes, that you need a plurality of starting points which you then try to connect. You make a distinction between abstractions and idealizations, which I think is important. Mm. Uh, could you perhaps tell us a little bit about that? It, it's an interesting and persistent feature, recurrent feature in philosophical writing, certainly in Europe, that people get hot under the collar about abstraction. <laughs> it's very, very bad to have too much abstraction. And that's abstraction, literally, it just means leaving stuff out. And a lot of abstract things are highly respected and very well paid. For example, accountancy is a very abstract activity, and people pay accountants a lot of money. Um, so what's wrong about abstraction in philosophy if abstraction is um, otherwise highly regarded? Moreover, it's unavoidable. Every time we speak, we can't say everything. We would, as it were, freeze, be paralysed if we try to say everything simultaneously. So abstraction seems to me unavoidable. But what's more interesting is what did people mean when they were criticising abstraction in certain philosophers? And that criticism has a very long history. So you can go back to Hegel, you can go to Edmund Burke, you can go to Karl Marx, of course, and many, many other people who criticise what they call abstraction, but what they actually meant was not leaving stuff out, but adding stuff in. And that's what I think is idealization. When you, as it were, construct a perfect uh, as example of a human being, an, 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 an ideal moral spectator, a rational economic man, whatever it may be, and you do it by putting all the nice things in and saying, well, here's our starting point. Mm. And uh, I suppose we might say that economics has done this rather a lot. <laughs> Could perhaps say that um, you described earlier that how you worked on these rational choice theories mm. and then moved on to Kant. That was to some extent a move from idealizations to abstractions. Yes, I think so. But, but um, uh, oddly, people have been uh, critical of Kant for uh, uh, abstracting. Uh, but not noticing that very often he does not idealise, he just yeah. says, we don't know that. Yeah. It's not so common among political philosophers to be involved in real politics. Uh, you're certainly an exception to this, being a crossbench member of the House of Lords. 
And philosophy and politics can be a difficult combination, a little bit like oil and water, as philosophy tends to be quite uncompromising, whereas uh, politics, so much of the time, is all about compromise. So it is a difficult combination. And um, you have said that there should be no politics without a bit of philosophy. Perhaps we could also say the opposite, <laughs> that there should be no philosophy without a bit of politics, that is, without mm -hmm. the real world making an impact with its limitation. Um, could you please tell us about your experience of doing both philosophy and politics at such a high level? Well, I, of course, uh, the sense in which I do politics is fairly restricted. As you said, I'm a crossbench member, that means a non-party member of the House of Lords, so I do not have the discipline of a party telling me how to vote. That is very important to me yeah. because I don't think I'd survive very long in that world. <laughs> um, equally, uh, the House of Lords is a large chamber without great power. Uh, it could hold things up a bit, but mainly it functions as a revising chamber. Contemporary legislation, as you know, is so complex and so detailed, it is quite good to have it publicly scrutinised by people who know a bit. For example, uh, a field in which I don't speak because I'm not expert enough, housing. But in the House of Lords we will have people who have been deeply involved in social housing, in uh, running homelessness charities, in providing mortgages, in, uh, in the building industry and so on. We'll have enough expertise that it will come together and be expressed. And I think that on the whole is the benefit of that sort of chamber, uh, so that for example, in the last six months we have dealt with a piece of legislation which I did not myself think necessary but is pretty important, which was is called the Higher Education and Research Bill. And uh, it was deeply unsatisfactory when it arrived, almost without amendment from the House of Commons, when it left because ministers had been persuaded by many, many points it had been made a great deal more satisfactory. Not everything, but most things had been earned out. So that's an example of what can be done by a uh, patient and uh, occasionally informed intervention in the legislative process. But you have to say, uh, you're not going to get a lot of things done. And now let me give you my parallel criticism of uh, not just of philosophy as a discipline, but of much liberal thinking of the post-war era has been, I think, um, shy about being realistic. Yeah. It's been shy about thinking, what do you actually have to do to implement this or that or the other? A very good example of this would be, there are a lot of people who will say, oh, but you can't do that because that would limit a human right. For example, the right to liberty or the right to security or the right to privacy. And the answer is, in my view, quite simple. These rights are qualified rights in the uh, jargon, and they have to be limited to, by one another. You cannot have perfect security and perfect privacy, for example, or perfect liberty and perfect security. But I think that many people are very reluctant to realise uh, that the real world does impinge at that point, and you have to think, how do you do it? Yes. And, uh, I would say if there's one perhaps very dominant theme in your philosophy, it's, it's that of uh, justice and, mm. and, and human rights. So I thought that we could go into some depth about that. You, you've t undertaken several critical investigations in, in a Kantian sense mm. of, of the term of global justice, human rights and so on. A, an investigation of what holds up under careful scrutiny and what does not in common ways of thinking about uh, this. Um, and you have shown how universal human rights can be justified, but you've also criticized the culture of human rights for making us passive, resentful and downplaying our moral obligations. Mm. So let's go in, into some detail. First of all, what are human rights and how can they be justified? Well, I wouldn't start there, as they say, with <laughs> no, so many things in life. One says, if I were you, I wouldn't begin there. Um, 
I would begin with a broader account of duties. Yeah. And part of uh, what I'm interested in at the moment is how did the word duty become a somewhat dirty word in European thought, having been quite fundamental to European traditions of thinking about what we ought to do, go right back to Cicero. Uh, and I think there are many reasons why it became a dirty word. One, uh, the over-exaggerated view of patriotic duty in the First World War, another the misappropriation of notions of duty in the totalitarian regimes, uh, think of Eichmann, think of the Stasi, um, but also I have to say the philosophers are at fault in part because uh, logical positivism in the 1930s uh, tried to wipe a great deal of thinking off the map including, of course, uh, ethics, aesthetics, theology and metaphysics, saying it was literally meaningless. Mm. As you know well, that the arguments were vestigial and unconvincing, but uh, partly, I think, because uh, Nazism dispersed the philosophers of Berlin and Vienna across the world, it became very widely known, accepted, and people were terribly timid about uh, saying anything about anything normative, rights, duties, no, no, no. And it's only, I suppose, in the wake of the Second World War, Second Catastrophe, that we see uh, the thought we have to rescue at least some of the uh, duties but they weren't called duties of the public domain. Tell you what, let's rescue rights. So if you think about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights or the European Convention of Human Rights, uh, uh, they are uh, classic documents of uh, the late 40s and they stress the rights. They did, however, have problems because people thought that uh, the rights were uh, really uh, just gestural. The phrase used sometimes was manifesto rights, mm -hmm. the sorts of things par political parties put in their manifestos. However, the two covenants of 1966, ratified a decade later, uh, suggested that there were corresponding duties, but they didn't say who held the duties. They said that the states should make sure that somebody held the duties. And that is what the Covenants did, and it's an improvement. But of course, it leaves us not very sure who ought to do what, who ought to do what for whom. And that is, to me, the key practical question. And uh, that is roughly where we have been for some years. And was it a good idea? Well, I could say in 1966, it maybe looked a good idea because the states were the powers of this earth. And uh, uh, the decolonization, at least of the European colonial empires, was happening. Uh, and it seemed that the states' parties were the likely people to be able to make sure the duties were carried. Globalization has altered that, in my view. And globalization has dispersed power in ways that make it harder for states to achieve um, respect for human rights and ensure that other people do something that would achieve it. Yes, as you've pointed out, some states are simply rogue states in which rulers have absolutely no interest in human rights. Other states, well, they would be happy to satisfy these human rights, but they are incapable of doing so because of economical conditions, yes. civil wars, and so on. So uh, the ordinary answer to the question as to who should satisfy, satisfy these rights, namely the states, is insufficient these days. So you, you suggested that we would have to draw on other, uh, other agents of justice. Well, I think that, uh, yes, that is the, uh, the difficult situation we find ourselves in, that there isn't just, obviously, um, uh, one category of agent or agency that can carry the duties. And uh, it's not just that there are rogue states, though there are plenty, and weak states, though there are plenty. It's also that even quite powerful states have very great difficulty 
with globalization because there are new powers um, and uh, weak borders. So the new powers, for example, um, transnational corporations or, for example, internet service providers. I'm told that the BBC had a, uh, a radio programme, which I did not hear, about a meeting in 20 years' time between the powers of this world. And there were the G7, and then there were the I-5, and the I-5 were the five top internet companies. And it's not laughable. Uh, and yet uh, these companies are claiming, oh, no, no, we just provide platforms for other people to do things. Now, there are certainly things that uh, multinational companies and non-governmental organizations cannot do in terms of satisfying justice. They will have very limited means of coercion, but you have suggested that they can contribute in other ways. And one can even see this thought coming forward through the, uh, uh, some of the United Nations discussions, for, uh, the so-called R2P, right to protect which is supposed to mean hum humanitarian intervention of a sort, uh, was one attempt to go beyond uh, uh, the uh, states. Uh, but there's also uh, the ruggy principles and the discussions of corporate responsibility. I think they're still fairly flimsy compared to what might be needed. But on the other hand, it seems to me no point in being fanciful uh, and saying, oh, the state ought to, the state ought to. And uh, uh, of course, nice if you live in that world, but we no longer do, and we ought to think who can. And of course, one answer may be nobody can, and that's a pretty depressing answer. If we look at Islamist terrorism today, which is a very topical theme, uh, it is very unclear whether liberal states have the capacity to prevent it in all cases. Um, there has been also a, a tendency in the uh, last decades to redefine increasingly more interests to rights. And this is clearly something you find uh, less than helpful, to put it uh, I in, in that it's way. I think it's very well-meaning. Yeah. People think that if they can add to the list of human rights, that would be so good, wouldn't it? Mm. But that is part of the cost, or it reveals the cost, of not having a serious grip on duties, because no right can be realised unless somebody carries the counterpart duties. So if you start dropping in new rights and, uh, of one sort and another, you just make it impossible for be people to comply with the more serious ones. And therefore, I would, uh, on the whole, say we do well not to inflate the original uh, declarations and uh, the covenants. Uh, they were ambitious enough, let us get there and uh, not try to gild the lily. Would you even say that it would perhaps be more helpful to try to downscale them a little bit, make them slightly shorter? Um, it, it's quite useful to uh, uh, edit it edit down. I feel that about everything, actually. <laughs> but I have to say, uh, you try doing it. Yeah. Uh, when you get in among human rights enthusiasts, uh, they have a touching faith in expansion as the only proper thing. And, of course, if they said, we want to make sure that the degree of protection for these rights is better for this group or that group, that's perfectly serious and realistic. But that is not what they say. They also try to add in some additional rights. And uh, I will not dignify them by naming them, but I, I suppose one of the more comic ones that has come to the surface in Europe is the right to be forgotten. Yeah. And you have to say, OK, please tell me, what are the duties that are the counterpart to the right to be forgotten? <laughs> <laughs> no, as you said, human rights enthusiasts have been too fast to proclaim new rights and too slow to tell us who should satisfy them and in, 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 in what way. And that is what we need if we're to be serious about rights. Yeah. We need to think about how to satisfy them and also uh, 
It's a sort of corollary of the fact that we assumed that the state's party would carry all the duties, that a great deal of effort is spent criticising the imperfections of state performance mm. on this, so that if you look at uh, uh, the whole apparatus of uh, United Nations uh, Special Rapporteur and the rest of it, there's a heavy level of uh, criticism of states and rather little, uh, though I have to say very uneven, and rather little of other bodies. Yeah. If we now say that there are, there are definitely certain, certain rights, and you have drawn the distinction between uh, rights of freedom and rights of welfare. Um, uh, clearly, one essential freedom uh, right would be the right not to be coerced. And you, in a very Kantian way, say that uh, you have a right not to be coerced because coercion cannot be universalized. But that only gets us so far. Yes. Because what is coercion? Is coercion something we can define in such a way as to apply to all cases in which it is relevant? Uh, I agree. The, uh, the, the, the difficulty of interpreting what the line between coercive and non-coercive behaviour is perennial. It happens again and again. There's also a tendency, I think, to inflate uh, the view there and to say something is coercive it, when it is much less than coercive. Uh, I don't see, uh, as it were, a, a neat way of cutting through there. You have to argue the particular cases, but it, it isn't useful to try to uh, inflate things there any more than inflating rights. Yeah. One phrase of yours that I'm quite fond of, mm is your uh, rejection of a moral algorithm. Ah, yes. Yeah. Many philosophers seem to believe that such a thing as a moral algorithm exists, so that if you only have the right moral theory, be it consequentialist or deontological, you can simply, by means of pure logic, arrive at the one correct answer as to what to do in real-world situations. Uh, whereas you, on the other hand, clearly reject such a view, and I I personally think that one of the most interesting aspects of your work in political philosophy is that you maintain the importance of judgment that is sensitive to context while at the same time being such a strong universalist. Yes. I think that's quite, quite unique. So uh, if you could please tell us a little bit about that and also inform us as to what separates good judgment from bad judgment. Well, uh, this afternoon I'm going to do a master class on that theme. <laughs> yeah. um, what separates good from bad judgment? Um, judgment essentially comes into play when we have we suppose, which is a big assumption, that we've got the right principles for uh, investigating something or deciding something. How do we use them in a uh, in this or that occasion? And it's, it's very difficult, and I think it's interesting. Everybody agrees good judgment's terribly important. And then you say, well, what is good judgment? And silence is very yeah. often the result. <laughs> uh, so I, I think that um, I came quite late to think about, does Kant say anything really interesting about judgment? And I noticed, as many have, that in the critique of judgment, he talks a great deal about two sorts of theoretical judgment. The sort of judgment you make when you start out with some uh, concept or rule and you ask, does this case fall under it? For example, I'm looking out on the lake, is that bird a swan or a goose? And it's a perfectly straightforward case usually, but not always, because we have many borderline cases. So that sort of judgment involves what Kant calls determinant judgment or subsumption. And we all understand that. It's the applying of the rule to the case. But there are also cases where we can see something, but we don't know which concept or rule to apply. I'm looking out on the lake and I say, what sort of a bird is that? I don't know what sort of a bird it is, or maybe it's a bit of stick, uh, whatever. And you have to find the concept. And that has been very attractive, as you know well, to many of our contemporaries, thinking about what Kant called reflective judging. It's very attractive when you're thinking about the interpretation of texts, whether it's literature or theology and lots of other things. However, 
neither of those is practical judgment because they both assume you've got the particular case there. And the difference with practical judgment is that you're about to create the, the particular case. You're about to do the act. You can't judge the act that doesn't yet exist. And so I started reading, and Kant is quite fragmentary here, some of his late writing on practical judgment. And he says, which I've come to think is the correct thing in an essay called Theory and Practice, uh, that what we have to do is to instantiate the rule. We have to enact the rule or principle. So in my recent work, I've been very interested in that sort of judgment. How much can one say? Well, it's incomplete, but one can say quite a lot, because usually the practical task in human life is that you've got a lot of standards you're trying to meet. Uh, you are, yes, trying not to coerce anybody and, and please not to injure them either, but you're also trying to be punctual and to be agreeable to the people you're with and, and, and. And the multiplicity of constraints, I think, is a large part of what focuses judgment. And when we say so-and-so has good judgment, so-and-so has poor judgment, the person with poor judgment probably thought of one or two considerations but failed to take many others into account. I also think that you had um, a funny remark in a recent interview. You said that uh, at present all too many books that are not classified as fiction are filled with fictions, very often with standardized and irritating fictions. So could you please expand on those statements? And is there a deficit of reality in philosophy? Um, actually, I wasn't particularly thinking of philosophical books. I might have been <laughs> thinking of books in economics. Yeah. <laughs> you know, once you help yourself to something like uh, uh, rational economic man or, or uh, let us say, uh, neoclassical uh, models of rational choice, uh, you, you started with lots of fiction there. Uh, so I think I was having a dig <laughs> in that direction. Um, I, something that does happen in philosophy, which worries me a bit, is when people think of an example and then they think that uh, by producing more and more and more examples, somehow they will reach to greater truth about the matter. And they even, which to me is extraordinary, invent uh, fictitious examples. So there is in philosophy an art form that deals with what are called trolley problems. Yeah. And trolley problems are where you imagine the railway trolley or the tram trolley is running down the rails and you are in control of a switch. And you can switch it this way and it will kill five innocent people, or that way and it will kill one. Now, should you not switch it to kill one person, but oh no, then you have been the perpetrator who killed the one person by deliberately switching it. And you know, I ask you, is that the way to do ethics? I think it's just a way to do fiction, and, and not very amusing fiction at that. No. Not very edifying fiction either. No, um, thought experiments, they can be helpful in order to clarify some intuitions, but very often uh, the thought experiments in philosophy tend to get too outlandish. And I've often said that if you need margins to get your point across, your, your, your argument is probably pretty bad. Yes, I think that's a good, good, good rule of thumb. <laughs> Once you have Martians in the picture, don't have intuitions. <laughs> no. And uh, it, it, it's very interesting because, uh, of course, uh, in deliberating, in making judgments in ordinary life, we may s entertain something that we don't know to be the case. For example, we said, well, suppose I put the car into so-and-so's garage, and then I said, oh, what if he came back tonight and needed to park his car? Mm -hmm. And uh, I've looked at something hypothetical, but not something that is uh, actually hyper, uh, counter, uh, contrary to the laws of nature, whereas the stuff with Martians uh, is just inventing things. And uh, I, I don't name names when I do this sort of philosophy, but there are people, and you can think of them, who uh, endlessly invent not merely fictitious, 
but uh, uh, examples, but examples that are contrary to the laws of nature, and then have intuitions about them, and then think it's morally interesting. Mm. Yeah. So yeah, I think we agree that you sh we should resist the temptation to go that far into the realm of fiction. On the other hand, we should perhaps also resist the temptation to be too realistic. In contemporary political culture, some will, will argue that, well, now with the threat from Islamist terror and so on, we must be realistic. You already mentioned the opposition between rights of freedom and the right to security. Is there any general thought as to how far could we go? Because many people have argued that the standard rights, such as the right to freedom, Tony Blair put it that way, that they were not wrong, they were simply made for a different age. So, yes. so that sort of uh, unprincipled pragmatism also can be pretty dangerous and erode yeah. fundamental rights. I think you hit the nail on the head there. That use of the term realistic is not quite realistic. It's not saying, actually, take a cold look at what is feasible. It's saying, do something, do something tough. Um, and I, um, I would go for taking a cold look at what is feasible. And uh, there are, I mean, the, the area that the uh, Niels Klimt Prize winner is working on, incarceration, is a very good area to look at if you want examples of uh, the sort of uh, fiction where people believe that, for example, a tough imprisonment policy is going to deter people successfully. And uh, actually, uh, it goes hand in hand with the belief that crime is rising all the time. Now, in most Western societies, including in the UK, most categories of crime have been reducing for some decades. And yet people don't believe it, and they persistently believe that tougher penalties will be more realistic. And I don't think there's good evidence for that. Uh, there's a nice book by um, Nick Ross, who used to be a television presenter, presenting a program we have called Crime Watch. And his book is called Crime and What to Do About It. Mm -hmm. And he has laid out all the evidence about decline in crime going hand in hand with public panic about rising crime. Well, m most statistics would suggest that even in this area of an increased uh, terrorism, our lives have never been safer. And yet people believe that we are under more serious and a greater number of threats than before. Yes, uh, they, they do. And, and they, they have heard that life expectation has risen a lot, but they don't take that into account. And you know, if it were really so serious, life expectation would not have risen a lot. And life expectation has risen phenomenally in the last 30 years, and not just in high income countries. And yet these beliefs in the population puts a certain amount of pressure on politicians to do something because they must come across as taking these threats seriously. So I guess we'd often end up in the situation. So and of course, we are, we are having uh, this being just after uh, more than one uh, Islamist terror yeah. episode in the United Kingdom. That debate is going on and there are people who are saying tough measures are needed and uh, people who are pointing out how very successful our security services yeah. have been in foiling plots. Yeah. So, you know, uh, the question you have to ask, in my view, is what's effective, not what looks tough. No, but uh, far too often, there are, uh, one is reminded of this scene in uh, the old comedy series, uh, Yes Minister, <laughs> where you have this phrase, politics is about doing something. This is something, therefore we must do it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you reminded me of that. It's a wonderful <laughs> bit of dialogue. <laughs> <laughs> um, speaking of freedom, you have been quite critical of how the concept of autonomy has been used in medical ethics. Um, yeah. One could almost say that much medical ethics has not seen much beyond the concept of consent. Uh, but here you also uh, make a distinction between two different concepts of autonomy. One associated with Immanuel Kant and the other associated with John Stuart Mill. Uh, 
Could you please explain the difference yes. between these and, and why yeah. that distinction is important? Well, well, actually, I don't associate it with John Stuart Mill. Uh, um, I, I'll explain why. I, um, because I was reading a lot of people saying that Mill was very keen on autonomy, mm. I uh, did a word search. Yeah. And he uses the term autonomy once, mm. and it's in his uh, essay on representative government, mm. and he uses it in the classical jurisprudential sense from antiquity, okay. where an autonomous city or state is a city that makes its own laws, whereas, uh, which is contrasted with a colony where the mother city or mother state makes the laws. And autonomy was a perfectly respectable jurisprudential term since antiquity. And Kant was quite close to that term, so that he thought the notion of autonomy fitted well with the idea of uh, legislation that could be for everybody. Um, the modern sense of individual autonomy, as far as I can make out, and I've never really done the intellectual history on this, is a post-World War II phenomenon, initially associated very much with existentialism. And uh, it, it meant what uh, earlier philosophers had called uh, freedom of choice. Or, uh, but, uh, and the whole Kantian thing had no part to play in that, uh, or the Kantian conception of autonomy. And uh, what has happened uh, is that autonomy uh, was then taken to be something tremendously important and the root of many uh, um, uh, bits of justice. And then, even more extraordinarily, consent was taken to be an adequate indicator that autonomy, individual autonomy, had been respected. This was a bit bizarre, because we're actually working in the, the Western states with two conceptions of autonomy. One which we apply in areas like medical ethics, where it's got to be informed consent, all very proper. And the other is uh, the one we work with in commercial life, where uh, consent is not uh, informed at all. So, for example, when you download new software, you tick, you click, you've consented to 49 pages which you didn't read. And which of us would read it? Because what do we learn from it? And, and anyhow, it's the consumer protection laws that are relevant in that situation. So in commercial life, routine daily commercial life, ticking and clicking, it passes for consent. It's nothing like the sort of things we're demanding in medical ethics. Um, but also in, in medical ethics, um, there is the question of, well, what do we mean by informed consent exactly? Because say that mm. if my physician were, were to say to me that, oh, your blood pressure is a little bit too high and your cholesterol level is a little bit too high but if you take these two types of medication every day you will cut your chances of a heart attack in half well that sounds brilliant uh, so if, if i were to uh, agree to that uh, I, most people would say well that was informed consent exactly, but exactly. it was it because you, he that, that physician could also have said that if you take these medications every day, and there are some side effects, not that serious, you will reduce your chances of a heart attack from 2% to 1%. That would also be accurate. So, uh, but that, very two, two quite different messages. Yes, yes. Yes, and how you frame the statistical thing yeah. is very important. Look, uh, I would myself regard what the physician says as adequate at the purpose, but I think I can best explain why I see it as adequate by, again, going back to a little bit of history of how consent came to be taken important, as important in medicine in the post-war period. So take yourself back to the Nuremberg trials, the doctor's trials of the Nazi doctors after World War II, and uh, somebody said at those trials, oh, well, you know, all doctors do experiments on patients. This was no different. And so the, the lawyers for the prosecution quickly got to work to establish what the difference was. Hence, we have 
the so-called Nuremberg Code. The Nuremberg Code, however, doesn't, isn't about consent. It's about what you ought not to do. No coercion, no deception, no duress, no overreaching, all sorts of very serious things. Consent was just thought to be a way of operationalizing the serious things. But in the medical ethics, as it transferred from the research field to the clinical, in, mainly in the 1970s, suddenly people thought that consent was the basic thing. And so we now end up, I'm afraid, with consent requirements, which even the hard-working patient can't meet. And so if you look at the World Medical Association Declaration of Helsinki, 1948, the first one, revised every four years, what is quite amazing is that now uh, the res researcher in this case is meant to ensure that the participant, the research subject, has understood the research protocol, has understood the, res uh, the funding for the research, has understood all sorts of things. Well, yeah. honestly, can you yeah. do that? No, you can't yeah. make people understand things. And um, on the whole, uh, there is a level of uh, explanation that is useful to people, uh, but putting all these extra details in doesn't make it more useful. No. I guess we can do the, the, the key thing from the point of view of uh, the medical ethics is that the treatment should not be inflicted on the patient who says, I don't want that. Mm. No, no, so, no violence, no coercion. Yeah. But this is also related to another uh, mm. concept that you have dealt with extensively, namely that of trust. And uh, it is often claimed that there is a general decline in trust, of trust in, in recent years. And you've argued that it's far from obvious that this is the case. And you've also emphasized that trustworthiness is more important than trust and that some measures to increase trust do in fact reduce trust. Yeah. Would you be so kind as to tell us more about your views on these matters? Most of the evidence people uh, cite when they say there's been a decline of trust is evidence from opinion polls. And most of the opinion polls have not, we've not had time series over a long enough time to know uh, whether there's been a decline. Uh, very often, the people who used to come bottom still come bottom. In the UK, for example, journalists and politicians come bottom, mm. uh, and judges and nurses come top, mm. and the man in the street and the woman in the street in the middle. Mm. And these are pretty constant over 20 odd years. Uh, so. It's not very good evidence of decline. There have certainly been er uh, areas where there's a decline in trust, but I suspect it may have more to do with people finding it difficult to place and refuse trust in more complex institutional contexts than they would when it's face to face. That, I think, explains the difference between people saying, oh, they trust their doctor, meaning their local doctor, but that they uh, are much less trusting of hospital doctors who are remote and tell one about difficult things. Uh, so that's, I think, one of the reasons why the trust evidence isn't very good. It's evidence of generic attitudes, and generic attitudes are shaped by many things, but not much by evidence. Uh, there are these uh, measurements of trust in which one compares different nations, and Norway and Denmark tend to you come do, out on all, top. You do brilliantly. <laughs> uh, but I've noticed that when this is reported in Norwegian newspapers, you can often find such formulations as Norwegians, the most naive population on earth. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I, I beg to differ because I think that uh, uh, you might say that quite a lot of when people say they don't trust or, uh, is or, uh, not evidence-based and they say it because it sounds more sophisticated, it sounds um, as opposed to naive and so on. So I don't think the opinion polls are the place I would go if I want good evidence unless I want evidence not of how trustworthy people are but if I want evidence uh, of how to campaign and how to manipulate. So the polls are very valuable to, for certain activities, 
not for discovering who's trustworthy, but they're very valuable, for example, if I'm running a marketing campaign and I want to know what sort of people would buy this sort of product and uh, or which sort of people trust this company or trust our X product range. Uh, so for camp uh, marketing campaigns and for political campaigns, this is useful evidence, but for different activities, not for placing and refusing trust. Now, could you perhaps also tell us a little bit more about the very concept of trustworthiness? What constitutes trustworthiness? Well, uh, when we're trying to work out whether someone's trustworthy, I think we look basically at two things. We're always looking in a context. It has to be relevant to the context. And we ask, are they honest and are they competent? And then a third thing, which, which is, are they reliably evident, uh, competent and honest? Those are the two things that matter. So I think we uh, are quite good at that in everyday ways. Uh, you know, when I cross the road, I don't stand like um, on, on the edge of the road, like Buridan's ass, who couldn't decide which way to go. I make a judgment about uh, how fast a car is coming and whether the driver's competent, and I cross the road. And of course, uh, trust is in, indispensable. Uh, without a basic level of trust, you would be completely paralyzed. You would not even be able to brush your teeth in the morning. Yeah, because the someone toothpaste might... might have been poisoned. Yes, of, of course. <laughs> so, so we'll presuppose a certain level of trust, but there are these fascinating, huge national differences, which I think has a lot of impact on how politics is done and how these societies operate. And I would go as far as to say that our high level of generalized trust in, in Norway is perhaps our greatest resource, more so than the oil. I think that's true. That's clearly true. And we unfortunately have a class of media proprietors who, um, having discovered that good news doesn't sell as, as well, uh, specialize in bad, frightening and um, mistrust spreading news. That brings us to um and another topic that you worked on, namely the ethics of communication. Yeah. And uh, this topic is clearly of great importance uh, in light of recent development in politics yeah. and yeah. the media. And of course, there's nothing new about the abuse of language in politics. That's yeah. probably been there for as long as there has been politics at all. And one can think of such essays as Orwell's mm. Politics and the English Language or more recently Harry Frankfurt's essay on bullshit. Yes. Um, but one is tempted to say that uh, the disregard for truth from the Trump administration is almost unprecedented. Uh, how are we to respond to politicians who simply have no interest in truth? And how do you see the prospect of democratic discourse and public reason in the age of social media and the echo chambers? This is a huge, quite wide. Question, yeah. It's a wide question, but I think it's a very urgent question for us. Um, I'm uh, pessimistic, and I do think that Trump has revealed to us uh, uh, quite new possibilities, because when uh, he is uh, discovered to have uh, asserted something that is not the case, he just moves on. Sometimes he reasserts, sometimes he changes his mind, but he seems to be in a certain way truth insensitive. Mm. And I find that pretty worrying. Mm. Uh, so we've got that problem, but we've got a, a, a widespread problem uh, with the use made of, uh, uh, yes, social media, and particularly of uh, anonymous communication. And the great discipline on communication when we're face to face is that I can be called out. People can say, well, what's your evidence for that? And if I say, oh, nothing, I made it up, or cite something that is clearly known to be false, it will not be good for my reputation or the conversation. Uh, whereas in social media, you don't see where it's coming from. And all the minor uh, sorts of damage that we worry about a lot uh, trolling or uh, 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 exploitation of children or child uh, or pornography, all these minor things um, trade on anonymity. 
And I think it's very interesting that we, we have perhaps got to rethink that, by which I don't mean uh, that we allow, this is a very old fashioned view, but I hear it all the time. It's not about allowing the security services to read all your emails. I think it, it's probably about uh, rethinking the legislation under which the internet service providers work, because at the moment, they claim to be providing platforms, whereas it is arguable that they are publishers. Now, publishers are in a different legal position in that they have uh, to, uh, for example, they're subject to the laws on defamation. And it makes a huge difference. A newspaper will be subject to the laws on defamation. Uh, so will, of course, a radio programme. That is why people take some care in uh, print, but they take less care if they think it's anonymous. And I'm sure you have had, I'm very sorry that a good Norwegian word has been put to such horrible use in word trolling, <laughs> but, <laughs> but uh, yes, I'm sure you have friends who have been trolled. And it is a striking phenomenon. Yes, it is. Um, what I think is also quite uh, important is what we could perhaps almost call the, the institutional, institutionalization of confirmation bias. Of course, we all yes. suffer from confirmation yes. bias. Yes. But what we, to such a great extent, find in social media these days is that first these algorithms, they filter out the news you do not wish to hear, and you only get the news you wish to hear. That, that is the theme of a, a, a very recent book by Cass Sunstein called Hashtag Republic, Social Media and Something. And he's, he says that as he was writing it, he uh, took the idea you've just explained about uh, the getting only the news that agrees with what you already say you like. Mm. Um, and, and he said, imagine if there was a newspaper called The Daily Me. Mm. And then he discovered there it is. exists. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's very worrying. You know, one of the things that I uh, uh, regard as the greatest privilege of being involved in public life is that you continually hear uh, positions that you do not agree with, because you have to sit there and listen to the stuff. And uh, I think it's quite frightening. Now, newspapers were always, to some extent, party pre. Yeah. To some extent, a newspaper would be presenting people with the same political views that they, of a general sort that they already held. But of course, good newspapers also invented things like the op-ed, uh, opinion pieces that would challenge the consensus of that newspaper. There's no reason to think that um, uh, when you filter the uh, news people get through algorithms, there will be anything like that. So, so you get the most grotesque uh, false beliefs. I watched a television programme about one of those terrible American school shootings, I think in Connecticut, and there's a group of people who believe that it's an invention, it's fabrication, it's fake news, and they have invented a world view where this and this and this is all taken as evidence that it's fake terrible for the parents of those children. So what sort of prospect does, does this leave for uh, the idea of public reason? It's a very big challenge. It's a very big challenge. And I'm, I'm not yet at a point where I'm clear what I think answers can be, but I think one of the answers would have to be that we, uh, no, we don't need to take a mid 20th century perspective and say this is all about the security services snooping on your private correspondence or filming you. Uh, it, it is much more like uh, altering the responsibilities of the internet service providers and then I suppose ultimately uh, blocking those that, that uh, pretend that it doesn't affect them. I don't know whether it can be done but I think that when you pollute the wells, you've got to think about some way of getting clean water again. And even if the water was always a bit messy, a bit messy is better than polluted heavily. Thank you, Honora O'Neill. Thank you very much, that was fun. <laughs>